The Quest for Designs podcast explores the world of creativity and design and studies the patterns that emerge that speak to the human experience. We delve into creative ventures such as graffiti, photography, video production, music, DJing in this episode, and many, many others. Please follow me at Quest for Designs on YouTube, Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, Twitch, SoundCloud, and Twitter. Take a few seconds to read the episode description as well as the show notes. The show notes are annotated so you can see at what point in time we talk about different topics. Pedro M. not only was one of the few advocates for house music in Tampa, but as you will hear, he was an active evangelist spreading the gospel of house and working to break down the misconceptions that people had about the music. I do also want to say a disclaimer, there is a trigger warning there for the LGBTQ plus community, but Pedro M. is well aware of the genesis of house music and where it came from. Thanks in advance, and here's the episode. Pedro, thanks for spending time with me. We're on a path of discovery here, learning about the Campa club community, specifically house music and shuffling. And in my research and many of the people that I've talked to, you are one of the pioneers that brought house music to the Tampa area. It was really kind of uh, the anchor to kind of bring in a lot of the sound that we hear in the Tampa Bay area and in St. Petersburg, where there's a lot of clubs. They focus a, a particular night specifically on house music. Tell me a little bit about the early days. You know, what got you started and in, in passionate in, uh, in house music and kind of what the what scene was like at the very beginning. Obviously, there was a lot of breakbeats. That's what Tampa was known for for many years. But uh, tell me about how it was in the early days bringing the crowd of folks that wanted to hear house music into the Tampa scene. So, yeah, I mean, you're, uh, you're uh, right of the money, actually. It was a lot of breaks. Uh, what happened was... And I'm going to backtrack a little bit here. Uh, I started in the nightlife scene in 94. So, yeah, it was a while back. I was still going to UT. And then I started a nightlife scene. And I had an opportunity to uh, start throwing some parties. You know, the usual stuff that, uh, uh, you know, when you're in college and, uh, you know, you, uh, if you have an opportunity to do some part-time work, I guess, you know, or side business, so to speak, you know, a lot of kids would go into a, nightlife as promoters and whatnot but i was doing my own parties and uh, and basically it snowballed from there now fast forward uh to 2000 and let's say i think it was one or two and i did notice that a lot of the people that i knew were going down to miami all the time uh whether it was uh space nikki beach and whatnot and that kind of house was not being played here mm-hmm. uh, back then. So it was called was a, uh, Winter Music Conference the month of uh, of March, which is now Miami Music Week, and a lot of people from Tampa use went down there. But they went down there, and it was all pretty much house or back then trance as well. And they would yeah. come back here, and it was all breaks. So, I mean. It, People will come back here and will say, oh, man, you know, Miami, this and that, blah, blah, blah. How come we don't have anything like that here? And uh, people tried uh, to do house nights, but they didn't quite work out. I, mm-hmm. I, it just, I guess the execution wasn't that good. Or they would do something like they would call it Miami nights, but it would be right. breaks. So it had nothing to do anything. <laughs> and uh, yeah. so, you know, there was not a lot of faith in on, on it being done the right way, I guess. Uh, uh, the only people, the only group that was doing uh, anything house-related in Tampa, you know, uh, uh, before uh, I did, was uh, the guys that were, well, back then was uh, called Snatch, uh, was uh, DJ3 and, 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 and the Serious Soul guys and those guys. And they were at High Park Cafe back then. And it was very, it was deep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, their focus was deep, deep house, all the deeper stuff, and they had their core crew uh, following, right. you know. Uh, and uh, it was a niche market for them, you know. I mean, it worked well up, up until today, you know. Yeah. It's a, a, a it was a very uh, uh, select niche market that they uh, have were running. I think it was I think they started. I think it was a, a year before I did it, or two, or something like that. Mm-hmm. And then on side of the spectrum was amphitheater which uh they were doing uh you know breaks straight up breaks all the time you know and dj icy and baby ann and shiraz and whatnot so there was nothing in the middle 
you know, and uh, I noticed that it was, uh, you know, the very deep stuff, you know, uh, whether it was San Francisco style or mm-hmm. whatnot on one, and that you had the other extreme, but there was nothing in the middle for at least, you know, my crowd, I mean, people that I knew, you know, and that's when um, all this uh, more in the tribal side of the house, I guess, came, mm-hmm. came in. And it was everything from the, you know, the, the, the Mark Knights, the Green Velvets, the Chus and Ceballos, the, uh, you know, Eric Morillos, uh, you know, rest in peace, uh, yeah. the, the Rogers and all that stuff. So, you know, and that's where, you know, we came into, into the picture back in, like I said, 2002, 2001, mm-hmm. to fill that gap, that void in the middle. Uh, and, uh, you know, there, there was a crowd for it. It just that they didn't you know, party here. And then the rest that didn't know, uh, when we started throwing the parties and started, uh, you know, I started pushing house music. Uh, it was an educational process because now that I look back, when I tell people the story on, 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 on how I pushed it, it was hilarious. I mean, I ended up, I remember purchasing, mind you, this was when CDs were around, uh, mm-hmm. an actual CD, you know, an actual machine and that you know uh, uh that you know made you, you would buy stacks of you know bulk of blank cds mm-hmm. uh, i would do the uh on a computer and basically every artist that uh uh you know i would bring before i bring him i would put a, uh, i will make the flyer round mm-hmm. uh down to the set from uh whoever it was let's say for example i was bringing i don't know the fire for example i would download a set record it put it on the computer and program it on the CD publisher so that, and that will leave it burning. A thousand CDs, literally, stacks, <laughs> open, burning, burning, one by one. I would go to sleep, wake up, the thing would still be publishing until the ink ran out. I would go get more cartridges and whatnot, and I would end up with literally a thousand CDs. And uh, back then, in 2002, we were at, uh, I was running Bahasa Lounge, which is not the Kennedy. Mm-hmm. And uh, I started bringing a lot of these artists there first and we would give to the crowd every Saturday night, the CDs with a flyer. And then I would give to the valet guys a stack of CDs. So every car that would be parking, I would tell the guys, Hey, do me a favor. Every car that parks, you take, (laughs) I can't believe (laughs) we did this. Uh, Distribution. Yeah. Yeah. Old school. Yeah. Take their CD. (laughs) their car whether it was uh, chingy or snoop dog or whatever it was take their cd out put it on the uh, on their front seat and put this cd on the cd player just leave it in there <laughs> the car. by the time they get out drunk they're gonna play their uh, the, their cd player they're gonna go what what the hell they, they would pull it out and look and then they would see it and yeah. then they go oh, you know badass oh this oh this is coming here and they became a thing also. And uh, this one I'm actually very proud of. I will be driving around town with this stacks of CDs and, you know, my, you know, riding shotgun. Right. And every time I stoplight and I hear people listening to, I don't know, back then, I don't know, Backstreet Boys or whatever it was. <laughs> right. I would say, roll down your window here with the sleeve, a CD, take this. I wouldn't right. say anything else. Put this in your car. Every, literally, legit, <laughs> every time on a red light, one by one. Today, it's funny because I stop at a red light and I'm looking and I automatically hear house music on the car next to me. Right. Yeah. You know. And back then, I had to give CDs, roll, knock it on their window of the car to roll down their window before the light turned green. Right. And give them CDs with the artwork on who was who, you know. Spreading the gospel of house. (laughs) That's great. (laughs) That's, oh, (laughs) that's uh, groundwork, man. I mean. Yeah. Somebody had to do it. Exactly, exactly. I mean, it, it, you know, a lot of people did, fly, you know, physical flyers. We did those as well, as well and posters and buy banners and whatnot. But there had to be another angle to be able to convince, basically, you know, a whole town that house was, you know, not a bad thing. House right. was cool. House right. was not only about drug music because that was the perception back then. Oh, right. it's drug music. Right. You know, uh, there was also a misconception, and um, 
mind you, what I'm going to say right now, uh, I hope it doesn't get misconstrued by anybody out there, but it, this is just a fact. This is truth. It's mm-hmm. part of his. It was, it was, it was perceived as uh, gay music, mm. you know, music for, for the gay crowd, right. you know, and up, you know, uh, 2002, uh, the last time I heard that, believe it or not, was in the, somewhere in the mid to early 2012 or up until then, I kept hearing that in Tampa. I'm like, oh, that house music. Are you going to play that house music? Isn't that, uh, the, you know, house for gays? Well, if they knew their history, it actually started from, you know, like, you know, uh, Paradise Garage and whatnot. Right. House music started from the black community, the Latino community, the gay community. Right. You know, in New York. And then it expanded to Europe. Mm-hmm. It got embraced by England first. Right. Yeah. And, and it became a culture for them. For what for us was still underground, you know, right. the warehouse, which is yeah. house warehouse, you know, house music. So you know, I mean, there was that perception in Tampa that it was a uh, tough music; it had to be, you know, breaks and whatnot. Right. Don't get friends in the break scene, you know. I made a lot of friends in the break scene. Right. I played with a lot of, them. but you know, the crowd in general had this perception that it had to be, you know, uh, tough. It had to be. You know, right. uh, it had to be banging, and, and you know, uh, you know the, the groove funk. It was still a new thing. They didn't quite get it. They, right. you know, it was, it was. There had to be, in my opinion, anyway, a full blown education on this, so that way. Uh, and then I would tell people as well. Listen, you know, you need to go to the right house party, so that way you can right. have an opinion of this kind of music, this kind of vibe. Uh, you know, and if you don't believe what we do in Tampa, uh, go to space, go to New York, right. back then, you know, go to New York, go to Miami, go to music conference, come back and let's chat. I literally was telling people this one by one. Through, so mind you, there was no social media back then. So right. le- le- you had to do legwork, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I grew up in uh, Denver and there was only a couple of clubs that played electronic music. There was a place, I forget the name of it, but it was a gay club. And they would play the best electronic music. So I'd go there with my girlfriend, and I knew it was a gay club. I'm like, it doesn't matter to me. I want to hear some good electronic music. This is where I'm going to go. And so we go there Saturday night, and my buddy's like, hey, man, where are you going? Though I'm going to this place. Isn't that a gay club? Yeah, but they're playing really good music. They're like, okay. I'm like, hey, man, it didn't matter to me. But um, it's so funny to see that, hear that uh, talking about it because, like, Tampa is such a big, like, kind of break and kind of like hardcore kind of town, as you know, as far as the, the the younger crowd that were into the music and stuff like that. I've only been in this town about a decade or so. And I went to high school in the in the late '90s there, so you know, back in the day when we would go to a rave, you know, it was everything was underground. You know, you go to the record store, you'd bring them something, you you know, pay for the the map to the location and this and that and the kids nowadays they have no conception of that they're like oh edc and you know ultra and everything like that no it was totally different back in the day and just uh yeah. i'm so thankful for getting in touch with people like you that were really kind of the message carrier to kind of bring this to the new generation because you're saying hey 2001 2002 this there's people that i talk to on a regular basis that were born in 2000 2001 <laughs> that are just going there now you know yeah. So yeah, they don't it, they know the struggles that led to this, and 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 not only for Martin in Tampa. I mean, you know, and and for the others in Tampa that uh, the uh, the OGs in Tampa that till today they you know they curate stuff. You know, like, like the the names I mentioned before, they still grind and curate till today. A lot of the new guys are trying to get into this. They you know they didn't even know what MySpace was. I mean, so to speak. You know, I mean, they had no idea. W- uh, you know, they basically landed on some, on a platform that's already pretty much set up for the, all right. the new guys. Right. And one thing was to, you know, back then to push the train, you know, and today pretty much it's a matter of just jumping on it, you know. Right. Yeah. It, it was work. Trust me. It yeah. was work. Yeah, and it's a different perspective. And I talk to a lot of DJs now. They're like, man, it's so hard to make it in Tampa, like on the big stage for for DJs. And I'm always just trying to get to the root of that. Like, what is it? Why is that? You know, because, you know, a lot of groups, you know, they have kind of their own network of people that they bring in on a regular basis and that kind of stuff. But tell me from your perspective, from, you know, from being an elder in the DJ community, is it difficult for people to get make it as DJs in, in the Tampa Bay area? If so, what is the cause of that? 
Okay, so this is going to be a multi-part answer. Okay, uh, so social media, at the same token that was uh, th that the social media helped to be able to put everybody out there, whether mm -hmm. it's the new guy, the older guy, blah blah blah, uh, and I'm going to give you just a, you know a couple examples. Some of the new guys that blew up, uh, let's say for example, uh, Zed's dead. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know much about their music, but I do know that they dominate the SoundCloud platform. Mm. They are SoundCloud artists, you know, yeah. with millions and millions of followers on SoundCloud. So if it wasn't for SoundCloud, Zed's Dead would have probably never really make it. You mm. know? Yeah. I mean, you know, because, yeah, you know what I'm saying? And at the same token, social media uh, and digital outlets allowed for the new generations to discover people like Club and Stroke, which is, I don't know, right around my generation as well, mm -hmm. or Green Velvet, or a lot of these guys that, you know, and for that matter, uh, Spotify and all these, all these modern platforms have made the younger generation not only rediscover artists that have been around for, you know, 30 years, 20 years or whatever, but also music that they would have never imagined they would have a taste for, say, mm -hmm. 70s stuff, yeah. you know? A perfect example is that TikTok of the guy uh, with the cranberry juice on a that skateboard. Guy. Yes. Back. All of a sudden now, they got, um, you know, whatever million of streams now, and the new generation now is discovering Fleetwood Mac, right. you know? And, yeah. you know, I mean, and just like that, same thing happens with house music. They're discovering because of social media while they're discovering mm -hmm. all these artists that have been around for a while. It's just that it wasn't on their circle growing up because, and this goes into the festival part, uh, the difference between today and not too long ago, just a few years ago and back, is that back then, you know, for many decades, there was club culture. Right. A lot of these uh, guys in the, new, the you know the new generation, they just were born straight into the festival culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it doesn't make any sense to go to a club. They're like, wait, what? I mean, you know, I you know I I'm turning sixteen or seventeen or eighteen or whatever. I for a few extra dollars, I can go to a festival and see one hour of all my favorite artists. I can dress up and, you know, as a unicorn, right. I want, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. no uh, dress codes, no nothing. I don't right. have to be inside four walls and whatnot. And, you know, that's the mentality today. You know, that's, it's, it's, you know, the frame of mind versus yeah. everybody else that grew up from, you know, all these decades in the club culture. And it was church yeah. for, you know, for that generation, for those generations, clubbing was church they it was festivals were like what no you know yeah. I mean, you know it, 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 you know for them it was a thing you know right. whether it was a club back in the day in new york or all the way up to you know winter music conference Miami music week and whatnot it was mm -hmm. the clubs. the festivals were like uh it's a too much too noisy too messy blah 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 you know right. the experiences were different one was a more intimate experience mm -hmm. the club you know, it was a massive one, you know, fireworks and blah, 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 and so on and so on. Now, right. all this leads up to the, 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 the next part of the question that you were asking me about making it. Because there's also so many outlets for people to expose themselves, to, you know, promote themselves, there's also been a surplus or saturation of DJs. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's the same reason. So social media works for and against you at the same time. Right. So it made everybody and their mother be <laughs> become a producer. And most of the times they become producers first and then DJs, which doesn't quite translate to good DJing. And at the same token, the reverse too. Usually guys that are, you know, that have been phenomenal DJs and they, you know, for many, many decades and they try to dabble into production. Eh, I mean, they might have success. a better, yeah. I mean, they may have a better chance because their ears are very seasoned from mm -hmm. all some decades of listening to music. Mm -hmm. So, give and take. Um, the problem with making it in Tampa is a combination of things, unfortunately. 
as the years go by in recent years, there's been less and less and less venues. Yeah. So the lesser venues, and then at the same time, there's been more platforms, digital platforms for people to, I guess, overnight become DJ producers. Mm-hmm. You know, I was telling them, Joe Schmo telling me, hey, I'm a DJ. I want to open up for you. I'm like, <laughs> okay, hold on. You know, at least wine me and dine me first <laughs> before you, you know, before you stick your tongue down my throat, bro. You know, I don't know who you are, you know, and I get right. messages like that all the time. And I'm like, all right, I get that literally in person or, you know, a message. So there is a process to this, unfortunately. Now it's going to get tougher and tougher, like I said, because I was thinking about this yesterday, as a matter of fact, after you and I spoke. And I was trying to put in my head all the thoughts that I had all along for these kinds of conversations. Because mm-hmm. I've, I've had, you know, these interviews before, you know, right. on multiple occasions. The difference now is our circumstances, you know, and pandemics and stuff. And it's tougher now. And we've got right. more to talk about than previous interviews that I've done in the past. But the problem now is that there's a surplus of all these new artists, DJs, and, and producers Across America and around the world, mind you. Mind you, I'm stuck in South America right now. Nothing right. is open. Right. No, nope, no festivals, nothing. And they do have Ultra here as well. And Creamfields is here. I mean, they're thinking about December, January to open the clubs and stuff. Not even. I mean, so this is a worldwide problem, mm-hmm. but especially the U.S. The U.S. has been more drastic about about this. The U.S. is has been already was having before pre-pandemic nightlife problems mm. because of the one of the reasons why I was telling you is uh, the new generations with the festival culture, not the you know growing club up culture. with festivals, yeah, and not club. So a lot of places in New York were closing down, Miami were closing down, Denver were closing down, like Beta Club and mm-hmm. whatnot, and so forth and so on. So we're running out of venues in the U.S. and the the less venues, the more difficult it's going to be for uh, more people to become DJs and producers because it becomes a funnel. Right. Like the Tampa case. The Tampa case, pre pandemic, uh, up until the last three years, uh, there was, I mean, we were uh, doing jacks. We were running jacks for 10 years. Uh, we ended up leaving uh, uh, for a number of reasons. Mm-hmm. We had a leave years and moved to district three moved the whole party to district three and then as soon as district three got sold to the the jeff vinnick and bill gates uh, uh, you know the svp crew mm-hmm. the channel side, uh we noticed that blue martini closed green iguana closed uh, it, it was a bunch of places started shutting down push and st pete closed yep. it was literally a span of months it was boom 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 and we're like okay and then i noticed base new york uh ebs in new york closed I remember playing uh, that party was uh, the closing party, and I was shocked. Mm-hmm. Uh, New York closed as well, which you know, uh, 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 Cielo, New York closed, and I mean, it was just you know, output closed and system closed, and then Miami. I mean, you know, uh, from Mansion to I mean, it's it just one after the other, and when places like those in New York and Miami, and Chicago start closing, mm-hmm. red flags start going yeah. up. And- is that you know something is not right something is missing and the new generations are not getting the message about club culture and that, that translates in tampa bay to where now on top of that pandemic hits right let are gonna survive mm-hmm. okay now their nightlife is trying to come back yeah. uh in, in a you know i mean it's for lack, for lack of a better phrase it's crawling out of the quicksand in yeah. general around the world is crawling out of the quicksand i mean with a barely any you know any breath yeah and you know uh right now i mean the ritz is trying to do the make you know trying to do the best they can and mm-hmm. make out of it you know uh, i mean tangra and that you know that's as far as i can i see from down here anyway that's pretty much yeah. it yeah, Hyde Park yeah. Cafe is not, not open until this week. I think it's opening this week, but Hyde Park Cafe has been closed since March. Tangra yeah. and, and the Ritz are open limited availability the last couple of weeks. I've been to both venues recently, 
And wow, what a dramatic change. There's still a lot of people on Chandra like Thursday night, you know, it's college night. So there's a lot of people there. But still, I mean, it's just a, it's a far cry from what it used to be. Well, I mean, it's a combination of, I mean, some people are still scared of this, of COVID. Right. And not blame them. I mean, you know, those people have either know somebody that has died from this or, you know, a relative or something, you know. But, yeah, some people are actually legit scared. And I don't blame them. Listen, yeah. I'm down here. And the difference, the biggest difference I noticed between the U.S. and down here is down here, they cannot afford to hide things because. Because they just don't have the money like the U.S. Like talking right. about governments and stuff. Like yeah. the U.S. to hide and sugarcoat things to people. Yes, you'll uh, turn on the news in the U.S. and uh, the COVID numbers spike. But they're not showing you the bodies because they don't want people to freak the fu- fuck out. Right. Down here, you can't even afford to hide the coffins. Right. You know? I mean, they're filming literally the common graves and putting them on the news. And I'm like, oh, my God. You know, I mean, and people in the U.S. don't get to see that. Right. So I, I, by being down here, to me, it was a slap of reality on what really has been going on. Right. Versus, and the people in the U.S. that have been saying that this is a conspiracy, this is not true. Right. I, they haven't seen what I've seen. Right. Being, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that being said, a lot of people are afraid. There's mm-hmm. still a few people afraid of going out in the U.S. Uh, some others... College kids in the U.S. have always been, for lack of, and then again, I like my brother. They just don't give a shit. Right. Most part. Yeah. And why most colleges have closed again? Mm-hmm. They open and close because they're not quite getting it, and they're in their college years, so they're gonna go like, hey, if I get COVID, I get COVID. Fuck it. So right. they're going out these days. Uh, from what I hear, they're packing out Tangra. My boy Italo runs that place, and 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 I, I've I've played there many times. I was a resident there on the rooftop, yeah. but it's a small venue. I mean, it's got many uh, plenty of floor, uh, floors, but it is not a big venue, so no. it, yeah. it can pack out pretty quick, you know. Yeah. So, but that's pretty much all they got right now. So let's say, I mean, from what I can recall, and this is on top of my head, I think one time I counted about 174. You know, from what I saw in general, uh, one day I was talking to someone, uh, I think it was Jason Kitchen or one of those guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and I kind of counted like 174 uh, what you call electronic DJs in Tampa Bay. Yeah. And up until like, I think it was last year, like 174, some crazy number like that. Wow. And I'm like, where are we going to put all, you know, where would you put these? I mean, if you have a seven and, and, man rotation, what you still am not going to have. Exactly. <laughs> you can 35 minutes, but then it becomes a problem because, you know, then you start and then becomes problem. The next problem, which is you start getting the crowd used to that kind of format, which is not good. Right. You know, today you got the new generations calling an, a two hour set, an extended set. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> I mean, Imagine what would happen if you give them a five-hour set or, you know, have the cooker drills or, you know, the guys like the Martinez brothers do a 38-hour set. They would, they would probably die, right. you know? Today, the standard, now they're calling a two-hour sets extended, and I'm like, and that's because it's gotten used to that festival format of playing yeah. 45 minutes to an hour, you yeah. know? Yeah. And the crowds are starting to get used to that, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. So the days of the long set the extended set, the journey, the telling the story right. are very difficult to come by these days. And the new generations will understand it because they want the bangers from the get-go. So this is the Spotify generation. So they want the single. They don't want the album. They don't want to have the whole experience like you're saying and, 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 and listen to Pink Floyd, The Wall, or The Dark Side of the Moon from start to finish. No, they want to hear the banger right from the top and then put all the ones in between and have the closer at the end. Exactly, exactly. So experiment, and because of what you just said, experimenting with new sounds is very difficult today because yes. the attention span is minimal. Right. It's become minimal. You can lose the attention span of a crowd today in a matter of 15 seconds. Mm-hmm. Before, you know, if you played one off track and then a second off track, a third off track, then you would notice people going, all right. But now it's like in 15 seconds and all of a sudden. So it's like because of that festival culture it's like you know i'm like all right you know what i'm saying 
And the, all these things add up to that uh, issue. Going back to the problem with me just today, find, uh, finding work, uh, mm-hmm. trying to make it. In, well, for, for starters, Tampa Bay wasn't exactly Amsterdam to begin right. with. Yeah. It was, it was kind of a baby that needed to get nurtured and, and, yeah. and fed day one. Yeah. It still is. You know, 90% of Tampa Bay still listen to Top 40. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, it's yourself for bars. It, it sells more liquor. And at the end of the day, not for nothing. I mean, nightlife. Uh, we're in the we're in the industry of selling booze, right? You know what I'm saying. Yep. And that's the everybody needs to understand is that because a lot of the, a mistake that a lot of the new guys, you know, a lot of the newbies and, and and people that are you know are starting off in the industry as promoters or whatever. Mm-hmm. I get everybody wants to be a purist and an ideologist when you're young and right, but it's a hard hard lesson when you lose your ass okay and don't understand how this industry works first and foremost you're in the industry doesn't matter what you do musically you're in the industry of selling booze Mm -hmm. so whatever you do the bar's got to work because if not you got bills to pay the electric rent Mm -hmm. you have that come into play you got you know uh, a staff i mean all these come into play Behind the bar, you got to be moving product because until the day comes that the U.S. Constitution changes and we're able to sell party favors behind the bar, which <laughs> is not going to happen. Right. You're in the booze. Right. So you got to find fine line, the balance between both to make it work. Mm-hmm. In this case, economically, with the selling of booze. Right. That's the reason why 40 is the sure safe bet for more for most bars and clubs that are looking to op- open up. Right. You try to stay away from electronic music, and then you got people going, "Oh man, they don't understand the culture." You know, uh, you know. Oh, of course, they want to do top forty. Well, I mean, they just invested. I don't know, you know, a million dollars in a venue. Mm-hmm. You know, it's 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 the way you put a business plan to make it work. That if you sell enough booze to make it work and make you know, uh, pay the bills and make somewhat of a profit because nobody works for free. Right. But if you're not doing then you're not doing it. And that's the problem with a lot of people that try to get into the industry mm-hmm. with the technology and trying to be purist, trying to think, oh, uh, I want to turn Tampa into Berlin. No, you're not. It's Tampa. <laughs> yeah. Not even you can pull that off. You're not much less going to do it in Tampa. You right. know? <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> I'm into this, you know, uh, you know, with a beautiful idea, right. concept. Yeah, it's, it's very it's romantic. Not, but... It's very romantic. It just doesn't work. <laughs> You know, yeah. it just doesn't, you know, yeah. I mean, I, I have an Theory analogy. Theory versus like, reality, you know. Listen, it, the romance, I can see, like, trying to get into the industry because you went to Burning Man or, you know, BPM and come back and say, I'm going to replicate that here and it's mm-hmm. going to be exactly the same way and it's going to work. It's very romantic. It's kind of like falling in love with your favorite Pornhub star. <laughs> but you know, you yes, meat. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not why. You know, <laughs> exactly. work, bro. you know, yeah. So yeah, leave it here, leave it. You know, so yeah, you gotta find. It. So you gotta come with. It has to have. It, it, you know, it has. It has to make sense. Right. It has and to be based in reality. Exactly. Yeah. And unfortunately, and 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 going back to what you're saying about trying to make it for, the, for all the guys asking you about making it in Tampa. If they moved to Tampa to be a DJ, obviously they didn't do enough research. Mm-hmm. And I don't mean to double. I'm just trying to, you know, I, you know, I, I'm, be I'm being real. real. Mm-hmm. So I much rather have people know the truth from the get go, as opposed to just like, uh, hey, you know what? Let them figure out for themselves. Right. Uh, I, I wish they would have told me things from the get go to save time yeah. on whatever any bad decision I made because I didn't have anybody to really guide me along the way so i literally had to go to the pitfalls right if somebody's moving from a dj they're in the wrong city if anything you know maybe my the problem is that now right now with the pandemic there's nothing really you yeah. know whoever already had a residency somewhere they're going to hold it hold on to it for dear life right the I mean, best thing i can say for the new people that are trying to make it is don't focus on Tampa. Don't focus on a local scene anywhere. Mm-hmm. Produce as much as you can 
put it out there, go international as far as putting your music out there, mm-hmm. and if this blows over hopefully soon, at least your name is getting known, you know, whether it is in Europe, in Australia, in Asia, wherever. Who knows? Maybe you make it in China, you know? Yeah. If big in China, hey, go to Beijing. Bro, <laughs> they're paying you $5,000 a night. Dude, God bless your heart. Yeah. You're not going to find that right now. Believe right. me. Yeah, yeah, that's the situation with nightlife. At least the way I see it right now, you know. So tell me how you got stuck in Peru. How did this all happen? Well, tell me the timeline first of all. Well, I came. I was supposed to come here for two weeks in March mm-hmm. before all this, and uh, uh, I was coming down here to visit some family. And while I'm down here, because it's a lot cheaper, might as well do all my medical checkups, you know, dentist yeah. and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Get it done here, and you know, take a a couple of weeks of R and R, relax, and you know, they go and then get back to the U.S. and continue. Next thing I know. I mean, they're announcing on the TV here the president is shutting down the whole country in 24 hours. And they were telling people, uh, the president down here, they were telling everybody, if you need to leave the country, you got to do it now. And I'm like, okay, I'm one hour away from the city, literally in the middle of a desert, an hour south of the city in the desert coast. It's like <laughs> Sarasota, Tampa. Yeah. And yeah. I was. I was still in a bathing suit, bro, when they announced this. <laughs> and I only, it was like 2 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon, and they were shutting down the country at midnight. And the last flight of American Airlines to Miami was at 10 p.m. And the highway, it was a mess, bro. Oh, I mean, everybody's imagine. racing, packing up stuff. And then on my laptop, I have Trump, okay, right. saying, oh, there's nothing going to happen in the U.S. And I'm like, okay, all right. So... <laughs> It's gonna blow up in the U.S. because Trump is saying that nothing is happening here. Right. So I already knew that was, this guy here is shutting down the whole country. I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? You know what? I'm gonna weigh it out. I'm not gonna because if I run back to the city, and if I don't make it to the plane, I'm not gonna be able to make it back here where I'm at right now, right. which is probably the safe, safest place on the planet. Right. And uh, this area where I'm at right now. Uh, uh, I'm not going to make it back here because uh, the highways are going to be full of military personnel, you know, mm-hmm. uh, tanks. And stuff. We actually put our military curfew here. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I was like, and if I get stuck in the city, I'm stuck in the city, you know, inside a house for God knows, you know, God knows how long in a city of 11 million people. Yeah. Tampa, Tampa, Tampa Bay has 3 million. Right. Imagine. Yeah. It's like being in, you know, it's like yeah. bigger than New York. You no, know? yeah. I'm like, uh, no, it, no, 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 no. So I decided to uh, stay here where I'm at. And I'm like, all right, well, I mean, and they were talking about, oh, it's going to reopen in two weeks. I don't think so. This is a pandemic. I never heard of a pandemic reopening in two weeks, but let's say a month. All right. I'll yeah. stick around for a month. And I called American Airlines. Oh, yeah, we're opening at the end of April, uh, May 6th flights. I'm like, oh, no problem. <laughs> Next thing I know, the government started extending uh, the state of emergency. 30 more days, state of emergency. Nobody uh, goes out, lockdown. 30 more days, 30 more. Next thing you know, you got a military, helicopters. It was like literally a scene out of Apocalypse Now, bro. I mean, wow. it was literally... <laughs> out of the walking dead i mean the helicopters i mean the military were on the streets and i'm like what the hell next thing you know they just kept extending it and extending it and it became the the biggest lockdown in the world peru had wow. the biggest lock world just last week they finally announced the reopening of the first phase one of international travel and i'm like and they scale no nothing nothing more than three hour flights and i'm like Miami uh, is five hours. Yeah. Who wants to go to Ecuador right now? I'm good. North Bolivia. That's three hours away. I, I got no business over there. Oh, so I can't get back to the U.S. Yeah, until they announced the second round, phase two. Now, mind you, uh, the U.S., uh, uh, the government, did uh, 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 through the embassy, provided uh, humanitarian flights uh, uh, to come here and pick up 13,000 Americans that were stuck mm-hmm. here. Mm-hmm. And 
the problem was is that uh, they let all the uh, you got to sign up on a roster and then go to a military air force base mm-hmm. to leave on a certain airlines a plane from 1976 that was leaving uh, a militarized air base here in Peru to go to Miami on a plane that was from the Nixon era or whatever. Yeah. Okay. And they would charge you two thousand dollars one way to Miami. Okay. Jeez. The U.S. government would charge you that, and then with interest. Why? I'm like, bro. I'm like, let me get this straight. Belgium, um, Sweden. Everybody sent planes to pick up Amer- uh, their own countrymen here for right. free. Right. You were putting out loans for flights out of desperation with interest. Jeez. So I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to stick around here. And 1,500 Americans ended up staying out of the 13,000 to uh, wait for their normal flights to resume. Wow. You know, not to mention, you know, they had just now started to open nightlife in the U.S. Mm-hmm. So up until this week is still iffy. Right. So, you know, like you said, I mean, it's still not there. So I didn't feel the need or the rush to get back just in case something massive, hopefully not, right. happens. Mm-hmm. Uh, like a spike or something. So I was concerned about that, actually. So I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to rush to get back. Even if they open the flights, I'm going to wait a little bit more just in case, you know, they shut down again. I doubt it. Right. Uh, Ron DeSantis is whole about just leaving everything open. But if things get really, really bad, right. you know, I don't want to get that. Well, and then I'm stuck there, you know, with, you know, not doing anything while, you know, I could just be here a little bit longer and wait for, you know, wait out. So that's basically my situation, you know, I mean, yeah. uh, you know, I, I got a call from uh, a few uh, <laughs> news outlets in the U.S., NBC, or I think it was one, you know, uh, asking about my story and, you know, and, and uh, so, you know, mm-hmm. uh, I think creative folk, I don't know. I mean, so. Yeah, being stuck down here, but it hasn't been bad at all. At least for me, I was lucky. Uh, uh, fortunately for me, uh, I got family down here. And uh, yeah. So the chance for you to get back in the U.S. not anytime soon, basically, right? Well, I mean, it looks like it's going to be in November or the okay. beginning of uh, the beginning of November or sometime in November. That I think they, uh, from they're talking about about resuming now uh, phase two of international flights. Which that's going to include Mexico, Canada, the U.S., of course, and then after that would be uh, Europe. I guess the reasoning or logic behind this is that uh, anybody coming into the country down here or leaving, not to be exposed for prolonged hours to, you know, COVID or whatever. You know, got it. Uh, okay. Like logic. So, you know, a lot of people have died here, like I said earlier, unfortunately, and uh, mm-hmm. I personally know their parents died. From this uh, down here, uh, yeah, you know, it it's was terrible. They, they, it's it's really bad, and they could they couldn't even see their parents. I mean, on on the way out, you know, I'm like, Jeez. oh my god, yeah, and you know, it's 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 been crazy. So, um, and 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 people in their 30s and early 40s have also passed away from this thing. So they, they took it pretty serious here. Not enough ICU beds down here in the entire country as opposed to the U.S. So it's another reason they didn't want to overpopulate uh, the hospitals because they were going to have to leave they people dying. Yeah. Exactly. And not yeah. enough infrastructure, too, you know. So they had to be harsh about the lockdown. In the U.S., you get COVID and you basically go knocking on, you know, Tampa General. You're like, hey, I got COVID. I'm dying. All right, come in, man. You know, right. you put a tube. Like, you know, yeah. here, not so much. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so they're pretty strict about this, and that's the reason why you know they're uh, they uh, uh, I guess they're doing things uh, in steps. As soon as they open up the flights uh, uh, back to Miami, um, I'm going to evaluate them. You know, see how uh, uh, Florida is doing. If it's starting to look pretty grim, from what mm-hmm. I understand, the numbers are spiked back again. Yeah. I was talking to DJ Koo, um, to be a friend of mine from Tampa, yeah. hip hop DJ. Uh, um, just now earlier today, he's like telling me. I mean, everybody's telling me Florida's a it's a hot you know it's a hot mess. Yeah, you know, the Florida 
That's right now. It's like nobody gives a damn, and the numbers are spiking again. And I'm like, are you serious? I'm like, yeah. And not only that, it's spiking all the other places in the U.S., but in Florida, it's spiking up again. And I mean, everybody's is acting like there's nothing to see here. You know, keep on going. Yeah. So, so it's one of those things that if uh, things get real bad, I might wait a little bit longer and then you know see how things uh, pan out and then get back and. You know, like I said, I don't want to get back to the Tampa, and then all of a sudden, as soon as they land, they have to shut it down again. You know, yeah. because they don't have a. Eh, you know. That's so, that's difficult. Gotta... What are you doing there with? Uh, did you bring any equipment? Are you able to do any type of um, you know work with audio or anything? Or no, you know what? I only brought uh, my laptop and. Um... Uh, what you gonna call it? I have Ableton in there, and I was gonna start uh, working on stuff here because I'm, I'm uh, I was starting to move to Ableton. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm used to the uh, the uh, the Logic format and yeah, yeah, okay. Magic Music for many many years. That linear linear format, you know, working this mm-hmm. way as opposed to session formats. My brother was the one that uh, he's very proficient on Ableton in in Tampa, mm-hmm. and he was the one getting me into Ableton, convincing me and telling me you could do so much more, blah, blah, blah. And since you have all this musical knowledge for many years and all kinds of genres of music, you could be able to, you know, really do a lot of stuff here. So he was getting me into it. So I, you know, I got the program, downloaded it, ended up coming down here. And so I didn't bring gear to play. I mean, you know, and I couldn't get anything here because everything literally shut down. So I couldn't even yeah. rent gear. Right. And one thing I had I wanted to do was uh, where I'm at right now. It's 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 one hour south of the city. Mm-hmm. But it's the Pacific Desert Coast of Peru. So I have yeah. the Pacific Ocean that way, thirty steps that way. If I walk literally one mile that way, mm-hmm. it's desert. Yeah. And, and and sand mountains and stuff and you start going deeper that way just a few miles there's a lot of like uh indiana jones style ruins from the incas and stuff. oh okay awesome oh crazy stuff yeah you know, some, some of my friends that uh you know from that you know they also stayed in this beach community for their families because you know people were freaking out they stayed here secluded from the city they were asking me what if we do a live stream from there i'm like that would be insane <laughs> kind of like doing the live stream from the pyramids of Egypt, you know? Right, yeah, yeah. So I do have the power generator. I just couldn't get any decks because uh, everybody that has uh, decks and the gear are in the city. Wow. All the rent. Yeah, yeah. Stuff, you know? And where I'm at, if I leave this area here is outside of this, it's literally the middle of nowhere. It right. literally looks like Mars, bro. If right. I show you pictures, yeah. videos, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 pictures and show it to people and you're like what the fuck bro are you in like you know quarantine Another... in mars <laughs> it looks like mars I, I i legit looks like mars like a terrain believe... of mars. oh it's straight up you know desert arid and like dry uh, even a little bit reddish in some parts yeah. it's crazy yeah it, it's just surreal but very the complete opposite from florida florida being right. humid and tropical it never rains down here i haven't yeah. seen rain since march bro wow so people are showing me their little videos of oh pedro look out the window tropical storm you know tatiana whatever it is yeah you know tropical storm karen is outside and i'm like how do you know i don't remember what that looks like bro i haven't <laughs> seen <it> at, all. <laughs> at all it's like desert and yeah. not even a biological level nothing grows that way so so Jeez. i thought about live streams because if I was going to do a live stream, I was going to do it on something like that. You know, archaeological ruins from the Incas, you know, yeah, something cool. That would be some freaking epic stuff. That would be some stuff out of Circle, you know, those guys yeah. from Circle. You know, yep. those crazy locations. Yep. And uh, that would have been that. But that, that would have been the only thing I would have done. Because, I, you know, everybody started doing live streams. Mm-hmm. I'm not. I watched it at the beginning of a couple of them, but it, it, to me, it got old quick, you know, and yeah. I tried as much as I could, everybody. And, but the problem was just, and again, there's just too many DJs. 
you know, mm-hmm. not only the big ones, but also the up and coming ones. And everybody's like, you know, before it was hey, bro, check out, you know, check out my SoundCloud, bro. Mm-hmm. Now I was like, check out my live stream, bro. You know, you know, they were tagging me in their live in their live streams, and I'm like, oh my god, you know, there's just so many of them, you know, and it's just so hard to keep. And, and at one point, people, the crowd started losing interest, and I knew it was gonna happen. Yeah, it, it's not the same. To me personally, fifty percent of of DJing and throughout my life has been a transfer of energy. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, fifty percent of DJing to me is a transfer of energy. Every person has a different energy within them because they're yep. all wired differently, I guess. Whether it's by the grace of God or science, but we're mm-hmm. wired differently. Our brains process things differently. Our e- because of that, our ears listen to things slightly differently. Yep. You and I can sit here, or another person listen to uh, Africa by Toto, for example. Mm-hmm famous classic song that everybody knows right no matter what you are okay and you're going to listen to parts from the get-go parts of that track are going to stand out more to you than to me while to me other parts are going to stand out more let's say the winds or the percussion is going to stand out more that's because we're all wired differently so to me djing is 50 percent the transfer energy and then yeah. the other fifty percent is how your brain programs one sound after the next, one track after the next, building a set based on what you're reading from the crowd and receiving from the crowd. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Some people go. Uh, I've seen a lot of the you know new guys that they make their play you know uh, pre make their playlist prior to the you know to the gig, mm-hmm. and they'll go with a pre made playlist. And I'm looking and going. Okay, so what if this doesn't work out? What do you do? I mean, yeah. are you going to be able to call an audible? Um, <laughs> are you going to save yeah. the night or continue with the playlist that's not working? Right. You know? So to me, that's very important. Some people can capture that energy really quick and are able to take turns during the set to continue this, a certain mm-hmm. line, a certain sound. Mm-hmm. I think those people whether you're born with it or you learn it through experience, mm-hmm. those are the ones that uh, succeed for the most part or have a better rate of success, whether it's playing locally, internationally, uh, regionally, because they're able to adapt quicker. Their ears adapt quicker to yeah. the region, sound, to the people. You know, uh, There's a lot of uh, audio flexibility. Not yeah. to mention your ba- your mental bank of music uh, goes further back, so you are able to discover stuff. And, and and for example, if you play, let's say in Europe, and you play in Barcelona or Italy, you know if you play, for example, in Barcelona, it's different than playing, let's say, in Italy or like Malta or Russia. Mm-hmm. House wise, it's very different sounds. Yeah, you know, they like a lot of drumier drumier stuff in in, in Barcelona, where. And in Eastern Europe, they like more progressive, progressive stuff, more melodic, mm. you know, synth. Stuff. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Uh, the U.S., depending on where you go, East Coast, West Coast is very different. What, what they like electronically in the West Coast is a lot, gr- a lot grungier, mm-hmm. a, lot, you know, a lot wobblier. Mm-hmm. What they like in the East Coast is a lot groovier, funkier. Right. Uh, you know, what they like in Detroit is a lot of more metallic. For lack of a better word, techno. It's yeah, they want the yeah. It's the ho- the home of techno. So yeah, it makes sense. Precisely. Right. So, you know. So I mean, uh, um, as far as the live stream stuff, I thought about doing it. If I was gonna do, it, I was gonna do it like that. Yeah. And here and then I was like, all right, there's too many people doing it, and that transfer energy wasn't there. So mm-hmm. I'd rather, you know, if I'm if I'm gonna half-ass it, I'd rather not do it. Yeah. You know. And, you know, um, and let the others do it and have, you know, do their lives, you know, whatnot. And so most of the time, musically speaking, what I've been doing, I've been discovering, uh, investigating a lot of different other music. Really? That not normally have time to investigate. I have, like everybody else, I have plenty of time. So right. tell me about that. I've always. OK, so to me, the biggest decade in music was the 80s. I was I was very very young, of course, when this happened. But mm-hmm. have vivid memories of 
sounds coming into my ears and getting hooked on, you know, mind you, I was, you know, you know, a kid. But yeah. I was like, oh, my God, what's this? What year were was, you born? I was born in 71. Okay. So I was like, I don't know, 10 years, oh, 10 yeah. years old, years yeah. old when I bought my first tape, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, I bought my first CD on 87, 88, I think it was, and it was two of them, actually. In excess, Shavu uh, Shuba was actually the CD, and Depeche Mode Music for the Masses. Great, great group. Love Depeche Mode. Gold, gold. Gold. Yeah. So, so I do have a lot of musical roots in the 80s, and to me, till today, I listen to everything that I listen to today. And it always takes me back. You can show me pretty much anything today, and I can pinpoint the reference that came out in the 80s. You know what I'm saying? Yep. The 80s was the decade that gave gave the world the most genres in one decade. The Mm -hmm. most genres, the the, the perfecting of electronic sounds. Mind you, electronic in the 60s. But the perfecting of electronic. And with that came synth pop synth wave yep. cold wave you know yep. post punk and all that that today translates to the anjuna stuff uh mm. where there's cross town rebel stuff you know yeah all today when it comes to electronic music and even there was an album i think it's the weekend yeah One weekend those, yeah the weekend's into some electronic stuff now my house style tracks yes i think it's the weekend as a matter of fact their new album the latest album they ended up using pretty much every VST from the 80s. Mm-hmm. They ended up, and I think it was a weekend. They did, they did pull a lot of you know, synth sounds from the 80s. Basically, the whole album sounds like a synth pop album. Yep. Uh, and I think it was uh, the weekend. But I mean, I, mean if, I might be wrong on this, but I'm pretty sure it was the weekend. So a lot of this stuff is coming from then. As a matter of fact, uh, last year, the number one hit uh, on the charts was Weezer's remake of Africa by Toto, which is right. Yeah, it's back to number one again. It was number one in '83 or '82, I think it was by Toto. Mm-hmm. It became one 40 years later, and I'm <laughs> like, ah, fuck, bro, are you kidding me right now, dude? Yeah. And it, it was because of that show, Stranger Things. Yep, you know, yeah, it brought back so, and it goes back to what I was saying a little bit earlier on how digital formats are exposing the new generations to all this history of music, you know, whether right. it was Kibu, or Africa, or, I mean, Toto and whatnot. Right. And I ended up doing pretty much on a deep, much deeper level, of course, uh, the same thing during the pandemic. I started discovering to, you know, to train my ear for new things into deeper. I've always listened to synth, synth wave, mm-hmm. always I started digging really, really deeper into the rabbit hole of it. That 30s and uh, 20s, 30s and 40s French music. Mm-hmm. So I don't know why. <laughs> well, might yep. be there might be opportunity there. Hey, you'd be surprised how much you can pick up from uh, compositions from these people back in the day. You're like, oh my god, what happened to that? You know? Right? Yeah. Why didn't somebody use that? Yeah. Yeah. The or, it's the organics, the organics and how things were made before with a human touch mm-hmm. versus everything quantized perfectly by a computer today. Right. You know, two various different schools of thought. Um, Bosa, uh, uh, Bosa Nova from the 60s mm-hmm. kind of sounds like porn music, but <laughs> but if you listen carefully, some of the artists like Al, uh, one of my favorites became Alan Morehouse. And I'm like, this is amazing. This is phenomenal. The, the, I mean, the the bass structures, I mean, the organs they use in the 60s, which they're starting to be used again. Organs mm-hmm. like the doors or yeah. or, or Boba. the electric organs. Yes, correct. Mm-hmm. They're starting to be used again. So I started, you know, digging deeper into all this stuff so I can retrain my brain. And, you know, because if I listen to Dirty Bird all the time, I'm, I ain't going nowhere. You know? Right. Yeah. Wow, 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 wow. I mean, you know, <laughs> okay, you know, cool for a while, but Not a down pat. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, so you know, to me, expanding, expanding your mind and your ear yeah. to season more and more music and all kinds of experimental stuff 
it will always uh, break, you know, make, you know, make your mind when it comes to music and playing go, oh my God, I heard this somewhere. Wait, oh, this, or this gave me an idea to, for this and that. And, mm -hmm. you know, Start connection. To, wherever you go in the world, you know, you're, you're going to be able to adapt easier to the region. At least yeah. it worked, you know, for me, it worked that way anyway. You know? Have you ever heard of the synth pop group out of Scotland called Churches? Of course, absolutely. Yeah. T H E. Yes. I'm a big fan of theirs, and like I've told, I've told like whenever I play on my own DJ controller, I play the music that I like. So I'll play some of their stuff, and I'll mix in. They have really some really good house uh, remixes on SoundCloud, but I try to mix in some of their sound with some of the house tracks that I like. It's one of the my favorite groups that I listen to personally. Oh, Church is phenomenal. I mean, those guys are brilliant. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, those guys are brilliant. There's so many of them. I mean, um, I can't even recall how many of them. But I mean, I mean, oh, everything from a roof was the soul all mm -hmm. the way to, in the 80s. Actually, there was a guy named Jen Hammer. OK, mm -hmm. this guy was a producer for pretty much all the score for Miami Vice. Oh, OK. He was basically a synthesizer icon. The stuff that that, that guy came out with back then mm -hmm. it was brilliant, brilliant, you mm -hmm. know, Generations today don't know much about him. There's been a couple of new guys in the synth world that have been remaking his stuff, I guess, new versions of synth. There's a, a resurgence of that 80s synth electronica that's coming back in, whether it's on Juna form or on, on Juna Deep, for that matter. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, there's these guys from Italian guys. I became uh, uh, he, 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 big fans of these guys. They're called Glow Wow. It's uh, Roberto Ruggiero and another guy, too, that they came together. And I, I started following this since they started just, I don't know, a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. They only had a few followers, and I heard their stuff, and I started following him hard mm -hmm. and playing stuff. And, and all of a sudden now, this started becoming a thing to where you got people in festivals playing their, their stuff in, uh, in Berlin and all this stuff. And these guys do phenomenal stuff, mm -hmm. brilliant stuff in that aspect. And you got people like Art Bad, of course, and a lot of those, you know, you know, electronic synth sounds, you know, going for, you know. Yeah, I have uh, your Facebook page. It has your contact information for Twitter and, and other social media contacts. So I'll make sure to have that. Can you tell me your last great set that you played in the Tampa St. Pete area? Where was it, and what was the experience like? I mean, it was probably the Ritz in uh, uh, March, February, before I came here. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it was the Paul Van Dyke show. I think it was the last okay. one. Yeah. Ones. Yeah. Okay. That, I was there then. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I think it was one of the last ones, as far as I can recall. Yeah. And I actually I really enjoyed that, uh, that show because I was able to... I've been dabbling a lot on 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 doing edits and messing around with uh trans you know classic trans stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I ended up getting uh, a soft spot, I guess, for the classic trans stuff. And I, since I, I've always liked progressive because of what I was telling you about synth wave and yeah, you know, yeah, and stuff. I love synths and and stuff. By default, I do have a soft spot for you know uh, uh, trans and you know melodic stuff mm -hmm. and. And growing up with you know Depeche Mode and all that stuff, so yeah, um, that show I saw a lot of the faces that I haven't seen in a long time that came mm. out to that show, so that was a you know heartwarming. Yeah, uh, the people that were there, the trans crowd was very grateful because not only they don't get that many shows mm -hmm. uh, around the world, you know, because trans right. is not really a common weekend every weekend thing. Right, those people were. Very loving, very welcoming. I remember opening. It was my version of progressive, I guess, because I was not going to play trans because of Paul Van Dyke. Mm -hmm. But uh, my version, my take on progressive, with you know uh, stuff of uh, that I messed around the studio with snippets of classic trans stuff in there, you know, to bring back memories for that crowd. And 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 and, and I do have a lot of video from that night. That people have sent me, and I saved yeah. them on my phone. And it was, uh, it was, uh, it's it, the feeling was really, really good on on many levels because mm -hmm. of reunion, so to speak, and 
and that particular crowd, which doesn't get to go out that often, and being able to play a different take of stuff they've heard before, yeah. a more modern take, you know, of stuff yeah. they heard before. That was my thing that night, you know. And then, of course, Paul Van Dyke came in and blew it off the water. But, you know? Right. Okay, but cool. Not- That's funny that you were, uh, I was at that show. So, I mean, I, I remember having that great experience. That was one of the, uh, before the beginning of the lockdowns and everything. So, we didn't know how good we had it. Yeah, you know, until everything went down, then we were like, "Wow, I wish the Ritz was open. I wish this place is open. I wish we could just go back to the way it was." And you know, there were so many things have changed since. And you know what? I hope because I, I remember having conversations, like you know, with several people before the pandemic, and I was already telling people because I started noticing that the kind of weakening of nightlife in America. Mm-hmm. Because remember the subculture thing I was telling you about earlier. Yep. Yep. And I remember talking many, many people telling me, guys, listen, cherish your nightclubs because once they're gone, they're gone. You know, mm-hmm. don't be thinking only about festivals. Think about your nightclubs, your local right. nightclubs. I mean, support your local nightclubs because, mm-hmm. I'm, you know, if, if you're only supporting, you know, and mind you, I got a, a lot of friends in the industry in Miami and good for them. God bless their heart. But if we got people in only in Orlando, Tampa, like Jackson, whatever, only supporting, I don't know, clubs in Miami or Orlando from Tampa, you know, supporting the Tampa ones, we won't have a nightlife in Tampa. You right. Know? Yeah. I mean, you know, and, and, and the same token goes for people in New York or, you know, whatever. Nightlife in the U.S. was already weakening. Mm-hmm. Okay. Then came the pandemic, and then everything exponentially became what I was telling them. Now you don't really have it. Now right. it's been taken away. Right. The question once everything gets settled and hopefully, you know, everybody gets cured and this thing goes away, mm-hmm. what do you do? Are you yeah. gonna finally sit or are you gonna let it just, you know, die completely and then go like, oh, those were the days. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. Should be cherishing every single moment of what we had, especially now that it's trying to climb out of the gutter from the right. dead. Life, life uh, you know, and, and the people that are trying to keep it alive are really, really, you know, struggling and, you know, and the headaches involved. So, yeah. power for keeping that light on the end of the tunnel for all of us. For all you of know, us. And, yep. And when I get back, I mean, I'm, uh, you know, uh, I'm sure I've been getting, a, uh, I've got a few phone calls from people as well uh, about some, you know, projects, big projects in the future that, uh, it might be looking really good for Tampa as long as people are there to support them. Yeah. Well, when you get back to town, I'd love to be able to talk to you in person, but thank you again for your time. And I wish you safe travels back when you get back to the U S I appreciate it, buddy. And next right. time, uh, next time we do one of these, we'll talk about the shuffling part. <laughs> there we go. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Thanks. Rich. Appreciate it. God bless, man. All right. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Support the work of Questwear Designs by purchasing any of the available merchandise from Teespring or select something from my Etsy shop, where I have many amazing photographs available for purchase. All profits go to the advancement of creative endeavors through film, photos, and video. Whether you show your support by just sharing the interview, by donating, or buying merchandise, you're helping to fuel me for current and upcoming projects, and I thank you in advance for your support.